Trevor indicated my comments here are very brief. I'm mostly here just to introduce the panel. Uh, I will say thank you all again for coming. Uh, proxy advisory services uh, kind of have a rep as a very niche issue, sometimes one of the wonkier topics. Uh, so we're happy to provide what I think is a really impressive panel here today. To kind of <coughs> unravel the mysterious nature of it for those of you that may not be quite familiar with what the proxy advisory uh, industry is like uh, or why it matters to you all as policy makers. Uh, and also, for those of you who work more closely in the corporate governance space, this is also an opportunity, particularly with the question and answer space, to get a little bit more in depth uh, about what policymakers can do to reform the system uh, and some more of the details about how we got to where we are. Uh, so I'll introduce the speakers uh, from my immediate left to the right. Uh, many of you are familiar with uh, former SEC Commissioner Daniel Gallagher, who was confirmed by the Senate as Commissioner of the SEC in October 2011 and just recently stepped down from that position. Commissioner Gallagher has had the honor and privilege of serving the agency in several capacities throughout his professional career, first joining the commission as an intern uh, and later serving as counsel to Paul S. Atkins uh, and later uh, Chairman Christopher Cox, working on matters involving the Division of Enforcement, Division of Trading and Markets. Commissioner Gallagher earned his J.D. magna cum laude from the Catholic University of America uh, and also graduated Georgetown University uh, with a degree in English. Uh, next. James Glassman uh, is, served between 2007 and 2009 as the U.S. Undersecretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Affairs as Chairman of the Broadcasting Board of Governors. In April 2012, he was appointed to the Investor Advisory Committee in the U.S. Securities Exchange Commission. And he has a long career as a journalist and publisher, serving as President of the Atlantic Monthly, Publisher of the New Republic, Executive Vice President of U.S. News and World Report, editor and co-owner of Roll Call, and moderator of two weekly public affairs television programs on CBS and one on CNN. And J.W. Verrett, on the far left, is a senior scholar at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. From May 2013 through April 2015, many of you may have worked with J.W. as he was the chief economist here at the House Financial Services Committee. As a member of the Mercatus Center's Financial Markets Working Group, J.W. regularly briefs congressional staff, members of Congress, SEC commissioners, and other financial regulatory agencies on financial regulations topics. <coughs> Assistant Professor of Law at George Mason University School of Law. His primary research interests are corporate governance, securities regulation, and executive compensation. Uh, all three of these gentlemen have much longer bios. I've given you the abridged version, uh, but we're happy to provide more information on all of their backgrounds, as well as some of the work that they've done in this field, uh, if any issues come up. So with that, I'll turn the presentation over to our panelists. They will each give a uh, brief prepared remarks section, uh, by, after which I'll come back to the podium and we'll have a moderated Q&A session. So be thinking as they go through their comments what you're interested in, what you'd like to hear more about. Uh, and then when I return to the podium, be prepared with some of those questions. Uh, and I'll have some for the panelists as well. With that? Well, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start. and. Um, I just want to thank Mercatus for the wonderful work that Mercatus does, and um, I had the privilege of, of doing two papers with uh, Mercatus scholars with JW and, and then with Hester Peirce, who's sitting over there and who has a further honor, which is that she's been nominated as a commissioner on the SEC. So that's why she's being very quiet right now. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> even though I guess this is the House and not the Senate, but still, right, news travels. Um, so I, I want to provide a little bit of background. And um, the, two other, the two other panelists are, who are much more expert than I am on this subject will, will, uh, will give you a lot of the details. But, um, you know, most Americans don't know what proxy advisory firms are. But the fact is they have more influence on corporate governance in America than any other institution, except perhaps the SEC, and I'm not even sure about that. Dan can tell us. Uh, today, enormous power over decisions about how businesses are organized, how they're run, including policies on the environment, political contributions, and executive pay, is exercised by two firms that control, by some estimates, 90% of a single important market. One of those firms, ISS, controls more than half the market. The rise of these firms is a cautionary tale about the unintended consequences of regulation. 
So I hope we're, we're going to be t telling a story here that not only is directly about proxy advisors, but about regulation in general. So it started uh, innocently enough when the Republican appointed chairman of the SEC, Harvey Pitt, proposed two rules whose purpose was quite limited. Uh, he was concerned that large institutions such as mutual funds, and I'm going to use the term mutual funds throughout, but understand there are other institutions involved here, could have conflicts of interest when it came to proxy votes. And proxy votes, of course, are voting shares that you own, on the, in this case, on the behalf of the investors who are shareholders in the mutual fund itself uh, on questions such as board membership and, and many others now. So the conflict comes when, let's say, a company like Fidelity uh, might manage the pension funds of employees of, say, General Electric. And if a vote comes up that GE's management thinks is important, then Fidelity might feel like it might want to lean toward management to keep its pension contra uh, contract. So that's the sort of conflict of interest that Harvey Pitt was worried about. And the rule that was proposed and passed uh, required mutual funds to declare specific guidelines for voting. It was very straightforward, and it was backed by the free market members of the SEC, including Paul Atkins, Dan's old boss, and um, Cindy Glassman, who may have the same last name as I do, but is not related, although he's a friend. And uh, Paul Atkins, in fact, stressed after this rule was passed that it, quote, did not impose a one-size-fits-all requirement for written proxy voting procedures. Instead, we left advisors, that is to say the mutual funds and other institutions, with the flexibility to craft suitable procedures. Well, it didn't work out that way. The SEC's staff later interpreted the rule in such a way that led the mutual funds to assume less and not more responsibility for their votes. In effect, mutual funds outsourced their proxy decisions to ISS and another large firm, Glass-Lewis, as a way of meeting the staff interpretation of the regulatory requirement. And the key document, which I think the, the other speakers will elaborate on, but I just want to just, uh, just introduce it anyway, was a, a letter from the staff in response to a request from Egan Jones, which is a small proxy advisory firm, in May of 2004. And the staff told the firm that a mutual fund could meet its obligations by having a third party make its decisions. In essence, said the ruling, the recommendations of a third party that is, in fact, independent of the mutual fund may cleanse the vote of the advisor's conflict. And I'm sure JW will tell you much more about that. In addition, mutual funds got the clear message that they had to vote on every one of the tens of thousands, in some cases hundreds of thousands, of proxy votes that they faced each year. So here was a simple solution for the mutual funds. Pay the proxy advisors to tell us how to vote. Uh, both the funds and the proxy uh, firms were free from liability, or they seem to be, for, for bad choices except in the most extreme circumstance. So it was a win-win for everybody, except, of course, the companies, or issuers as they're called, and their shareholders. And I would argue also for the U.S. economy. And the reason is that these proxy advisory firms, which wield so much power, make their decisions based on some vague sense of how they think businesses should be run, a kind of moral sense of how businesses could, should conduct uh, their, uh, their business. Uh, some would say that's ideological or political, but it certainly is not the standard that uh, they should make these decisions on, which is increasing shareholder value. And I would just point to one outrageous example, uh, which has now become quite famous, of how the firms operate came when ISS recommended a no vote on reelecting Warren Buffett as a director of Coca-Cola because he had a conflict of interest. Berkshire Hathaway, which is Warren Buffett's holding company, owned Dairy Queen, which was a customer of Coke. Uh, never mind the fact that Buffett, a man of great integrity, I think we all would agree, is probably the best investor of the last 50 years. And, or, and never mind the fact that Berkshire owned 10% of Coke 
and therefore had its interests closely aligned. The problem was that these proxy advisory services make one size fits all kinds of decisions. And just as a little bit more background, the problem has been compounded as institutions like mutual funds account for more and more of total stock ownership in the United States. And as the government has required companies to make proxy votes on more and more governance matters, uh, most conspicuously on executive pay. And the, most, the, the main culprit here is Dodd-Frank. As Stephen Bainbridge, uh, who writes a great blog and is professor of law at UCLA, some of you may know him, has written, it seems fair to say that Dodd-Frank did more to empower ISS than it does shareholders. So I'm just going to... Um, I'm just going to wrap up here by just making a a comment about uh, economics, the economy. Um, So there are studies which which the the, the, uh, JW and Dan, I'm sure, will talk about that examine this question of whether the recommendations of ISS and uh, Glass-Lewis actually enhance shareholder value. And these studies show, many of them show that they have not. So if that is true, then this single regulatory change with its unintended consequences is not merely concentrating power in the hands of these two firms, but it's also harming the U.S. economy. So the real issue here is how can an institution make, and uh, I'm sorry, let, let me just explain that. So when shareholder value declines, because advisory firms force one-size-fits-all decisions on companies, companies that are really in the best position to determine those uh, decisions themselves. I mean, who, who better is in a position than the board of directors to decide how much money a, a, manager, a CEO should get? I mean, a board of directors wants to enhance the value of the company. It's not going to overpay a a CEO, or certainly not on purpose. But what's happening is more and more of these decisions are being made by these proxy advisory firms. So so when these these one-size-fits-all decisions are imposed on companies, then necessarily, and, and value declines, and necessarily overall output or GDP of the nation declines and people are worse off. So the real issue here is how can an institution make thousands of informed decisions on proxy matters? That's a real important question. And the solution, however, that the SEC staff has imposed is the wrong one. Outsourcing to companies that have to pass on proxies of 30,000 or more companies, literally hundreds of thousands of decisions, simply shifts the problem in the wrong direction. One conflict of interest is substituted for another, and I'm sure that JW and Dan will talk about the conflicts of interest that these proxy advisory firms have. So this problem has persisted for 11 years. Um, JW and I and Hester and I have offered solutions in our papers, and I'm sure you're going to, and as as has Dan Gallagher, Dan Gallagher as as an SEC commissioner. So you're going to now hear from, I think JW next, sorry. JW next. Thank you very much. I want to build on Jim's introduction to the proxy advisory industry and the regulation of that industry um, and just sort of provide a little bit, go up a few thousand feet to an overview of the place of corporate voting and ISS and Glass Lewis's role in corporate voting to a broader mix of um, factors that help shareholders to constrain excesses by management. And there's certainly plenty of excess by management that needs to be constrained by the market. But I want to put shareholder voting in the context of the price system in the securities markets that helps to constrain managerial excess. And I want to put it into the context of a concept called the market for corporate control. Um, So first, uh, why so much emphasis in the last decade or so on shareholder voting? Uh, Jim alluded to the fact that uh, there's an increasing percentage of institutional ownership in publicly traded companies in the United States, and those institutions 
um, are more active in voting than individual retail investors are. And to understand why, if you, any of you own stock, think about the last time you voted that stock. Probably you have not taken the time to write out a proxy card, but the institutional investors are more likely to, particularly in the wake of the, of the O3 uh, regulations. But there's a second reason, and it's a more conflicted and a more politically motivated one. In around, uh, around the late 90s, um, union investors, union pension funds, own a significant percentage of publicly traded shares, um, started to realize that they could coordinate with the broader goals of their organization. In the same thinking that led Donald Trump to say in one of the first Republican debates, hey, when I have leverage, I use it, I think union pension funds understood that the leverage they obtained through their sh interests in publicly traded companies would allow them to press agendas that were part of the broader concern of their organizations. And they did so in tandem with an increasing use of shareholder voting power by other institutional investors like state pension funds. And who runs state pension funds? Elected officials. And it tends to be that the elected officials of one party are far more active in this process than others. And so you can see in the agendas of these institutions a number of items that, that uh, might run fairly parallel with items that would be important to disciplining uh, managerial excess and related to financial performance. But you also see a much broader set of issues that appear to me, at least, to be motivated by more political and more social welfare ends uh, uh, that, that are run completely counter to the uh, shareholder uh, wealth maximization focus of the securities laws of 1933 and 1934. Uh, and this starts with a book called Working Capital that uh, unions uh, funded uh, back in around 1999. And you can see it referenced in a recent speech from Commissioner Pivovar, uh, where they laid out a, a number of different ideas, one of them which made its way uh, some uh, 12 years later into the Dodd-Frank Act the so-called uh, CEO pay ratio. Voting, democracy, sound like great things. They sound like very American things, like apple pie. But I would say that that analogy from, from, from democracy in the political sphere to democracy in the shareholder voting sphere, sphere is a severely constrained one. Um, what's the difference? Well, the difference is shareholder voting is just a contractual item that shareholders have bargained for in the charter of the corporation. And so taking all the dem dem democratic values from the political system and trying to analogize them into the shareholder voting system has a number of unintended consequences. And I think that's what we saw from the 03 rules out of the SEC. Much more powerful constraints, I think, on managerial excess would be the market for corporate control, a free and open market for corporate control that I think is constrained by a law called the Williams Act passed in the 1960s and a more free and open market for information, um, which is constrained, I think, by something called Regulation FD that we can talk about. Um, I, I think right now the, the SEC, which prides itself on the theory that sunshine is the best disinfectant, that phrase is often repeated among securities professionals, um, in fact, in, in some ways inhibits uh, natural market processes that would allow for more sunshine of, of malicious and nefarious activity. But to zero in, particularly on the proxy access, case. Um, those are a little bit of a taste of the ideas that I think would be better. I'm happy to talk to them toward the end, but let me zero back in to the specifics about uh, uh, proxy advisors and the <coughs> things that Jim was talking about. Um, one of the problems I have specifically with the guidance that tends to come out of proxy advisors and judging them not only structurally by how they're set up, how their market is created by regulation, which I think is a problem. Uh, an Avon, a letter from the Department of Labor issued actually in the Reagan administration um, with the help of an assistant secretary of labor who went on to found ISS to sort of uh, build on the market that he created by regulation um, is an issue. I think that structural creation of a market through government regulation is a problem. But I think you can also judge these institutions by the quality of the product that, that they put out. And I think a fair and apt description that Commissioner Gallagher has used and, and a lot of folks use is one size fits all. A lot of the advice that comes out of ISS and Glass-Lewis, the two dominant proxy advisors, is one-size-fits-all guidance. And they will certainly tell you, um, if you have a chance to speak with them in the future, that no, that's, that's not true. It's not one-size-fits-all. It's uniquely tailored. We tailor it to the 20,000 companies that we provide advice about. Our 200 people tailor it to the 20,000 companies, which they must be the hardest-working securities analysts in show business if they're able to do that. But let me talk about a couple of specific examples where I think that's not true. 
Um, there are a number of items, corporate governance reforms, that are hotly contested in the empirical finance literature. I say hotly contested. It's not like WWF. I mean, it's you know numbers and very wonky academics, fairly nonpartisan academics. I mean, people who are publishing in Journal of Finance, peer-reviewed journals that don't really have a political bias one way or the other, uh, like those of us who worked on the House might have uh, for a political party, but very hotly contested empirical questions uh, in which I think ISS and, and uh, Glass-Lewis's recommendation lean only in one direction, proxy access. They almost universally recommend proposals to institute proxy access making it easier for shareholders, many of whom are conflicted, to put their nominees onto the company proxy for free rather than having to pay their own way. Destaggering the board. So some boards of directors are kind of like the Senate. A third of the members go up every year rather than the whole board. Some are like the House. Being a House guy, I think the House model is probably pretty good. But <coughs> companies tend to disagree sort of 50-50 on which model works best. But ISS and Glass-Lewis take a pretty clear one-size-fits-all solution that leans toward board destaggering. They want all the directors up every year. The empirical literature is mixed at best on this question. And they mandate an annual say on pay vote rather than a triannual say on pay vote, sort of pretend advisory vote on shareholder pay that the Dodd-Frank Act requires, though it allows you to choose as a board one, two, or three year uh, 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 terms of, of revoting. Uh, and the, the, pro the proxy advisors say, no, it has to be one year. Now, there's literally no evidence suggesting a benefit to a one-year uh, annual requirement, but that's the way they work. Another piece of the securities law architecture you have to think about uh, when you think about proxy advisors is a system called 14A8, the 14A8 shareholder proposal process. What is that? Well, it's a process whereby currently... Before this rule, previously, shareholders could put an idea up for a vote of the other shareholders and say, you know what, I want to uh, change the charter of the company. I want to change the structure of the board. And they could send out the shareholder voting cards to the shareholders, and they could win. But they had to pay for it themselves. 1488 says the company should subsidize individual shareholders putting ideas onto the company proxy. And it can take a very low threshold of ownership. You only have to own about $2,000 worth of the company shares to do this. $2,000 worth of shares, a very small percentage of the company's shares. So what is the quality of these proposals? Well, a few of them are high quality, but I would say the overwhelming majority of them represent the kind of quality that you see in public comments on blogs on the Internet. I mean, think about the worst examples of comments you've seen in blogs on the Internet. That's the kind of stuff companies often get on their proxy statements. And these are things that ISS and Glass-Lewis will often provide voting recommendations about. So you see a second way in which an artificial market is created by the government, an artificial market that this duopoly enjoys access to. Uh, Jim mentioned conflicts of interest. There's a very important conflict of interest in this space that I would, I would urge your consideration of. ISS, the dominant player in this space, provides advice to investors and says, vote this way, vote that way on this proposal. But they do a second line of business that actually, though it represents a small percentage of the revenue, I understand rec represents a large percentage of their profits because it's a low expense business, which is they'll go to companies, the targets of these votes, and they'll say, we have some advice for you about what you should do to change your company structure. Uh, now, they will say, the part of our operation that advises companies about how to get a better recommendation from us is separate and apart from the part of our organization that advises investors about how they should vote in these company elections and proxy uh, contests. They say that. I'm sure they try. But the institutional investor community has been very skeptical of conflicts of interest in a lot of other areas. Auditors used to do the same thing with a lot of consulting services and the pension funds, and the organizations of institutional investors all said, no, we don't believe that they can police those conflicts. Conflicts prohibited by law in Sarbanes-Oxley. When these conflicts were, became apparent with respect to investment analysts, the institutional investor community said, ah, uh -uh, we don't trust them. We need some clear rules out of an AG settlement to police these conflicts. But here, where institutional investors and the union pension funds in that community see and recognize a clear conflict of interest, with their ally, their position is, 
We don't really see that as a problem. I think that inconsistency um, points to, to I think, further examination of those conflicts of interest. I think they're very serious. Um, and I wouldn't be as concerned about them if the market for these services wasn't created by regulation. But the fact is that it is in the Avon letter and in the 14A process. So I want to talk real quick about the guidance that Commissioner Gallagher was uh, 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 such an ardent um, you know, fighter for. I mean, I think when, when Jim, when, when we did our first paper on proxy advisors and the problems in that space, I would have thought it was a, you know, it was a quixotic quest. We weren't going to get anywhere. I just thought, oh, it would be fun to write a paper with Jim Glassman. So, well, yeah, I'll do that. And it turned out, I mean, because of Commissioner Gallagher's work, we got guidance out of the SEC that, that took a big hit in the right direction. And so I want to commend that. I think that's terrific. Some particular things out of that guidance the SEC did, and I think the House, I want to credit the House Financial Services Committee, too. Chairman Garrett did a lot of work in oversight of this issue. Um, first, the guidance says that companies can conduct sampling to make sure that, they're, uh, that there's compliance with the, the pre prior rules uh, from O3. I think that's good. That certainly will lower costs for institutional investors. And sampling methodology is so well accepted uh, in you know, econometrics. There's a recognition in that guidance of the right of mutual funds to decide to just vote with management if they, unless, if they feel like there are no red flags indicating a problem. I think that was very important. And we mentioned that. Jim and I mentioned that in our papers. I'm glad that made its way into the SEC's guidance. And there's some requirements about disclosure of the conflict of interest that Jim and I were talking about. I think that's all terrific. That's all to the good. Um, concerns I have about how we just haven't gone far enough, first of all, it's staff-level guidance. I'd feel a lot better if it was an SEC-level, commission-level interpretive release. I'd feel even better if it was statutory. But I, I, I'd prefer it to be at least an interpretive release at the full commission level. I'm concerned about the fact that it only applies to entities regulated by the SEC and not those regulated by the Department of Labor. I'm concerned about the fact that the Avon letter is still out there requiring um, ERISA fiduciaries to vote even if it doesn't make sense to them for them to vote. And I'm concerned about the 14A8 process that creates this artificial market. Um, a few other concerns and ideas uh, about things we should do. Again, the Williams Act and Reg FD and 14A8 are all problems. Um, I'd like to see some specific recognition that the Egan Jones letter is no longer good law. I would, I would, I hope, would have hoped to have seen that in the guidance. It didn't make its way in there. Um, uh, let me just stop there, turn it over to Commissioner Gallagher, and uh, looking forward to talking to, you, to all of you in the Q&A. Uh, former, former Commissioner. Former, yes. Uh, a mental note, never follow Professor Barrett uh, on the panel again. Prove how ineloquent I am or how eloquent you are. I'm suffering with a little cold here, so I'm going to try to <coughs> keep it short. Uh, it's a real honor, first of all, to be here. Thanks to Mercatus for inviting me. Thanks for you guys uh, showing up. This is a really, really important issue, and I wanted to pivot off the first two sets of remarks to kind of uh, figure how I would add value here. And I think the value I can add for you is to explain to you why you need to care about this issue, because it really does sound so picky and so discreet compared to all of the other things that you have to deal with uh, in your day-to-day -day jobs and your bosses have to deal with. And I will tell you, coming into the SEC in November of 2011, right, a year or so after Dodd-Frank, the last thing in the world I thought I would be focusing on, in fact, I didn't even know what a proxy advisory firm was uh, when I came back as a commissioner. So to think that I would come in and need to you know, focus so much of my attention and time and energies on this issue really was surprising to me. And let me tell you why. And this is the same conversation I'll tell you about, a little conversation I had with the CEO of one of the proxy advisory firms. After about three or four speeches I gave on the same subject, and most of you who read uh, or followed my speeches over my four-year term know that I rarely, if ever, gave the same speech or talked about the same issue uh, twice. And uh, there are a couple exceptions, one of them being proxy advisory firms. And that prompted the CEO to ask for a meeting with me, come in, very polite. But he started the meeting by asking me, why in the world, can I ask you, are you so intensely focused on this issue? And my response to him was, because, Mr. X, uh, because... I've gotten more complaints about you and your industry as an SEC commissioner than anything else since I've walked in this door. And that, that is really, think about it, post-Dodd-Frank, post-financial crisis, 
the stream of complaints I was getting from the issuer community, from the advisor community, from trade groups. I had CEOs fly in to Washington to meet with me one-on-one -on -one after they saw my remarks in this space. It, it was an open and obvious issue for the commission to address. I still believe it's an open and obvious issue for you and your bosses to address. I don't believe, uh, despite some of the politics that surround uh, this issue, given some of the voting recommendations and, uh, as Professor Verrett mentioned, how partisan sometimes they may seem uh, to the other party, I don't think this is a partisan issue. This is about good government. Uh, this is about a, a uh, you know, an industry that was, as Professor Verrett said, created by regulation. If you go back to the, to the Avon letter of 88, which said, if you advise uh, uh, on ERISA assets, you have to vote. So every vote you have to, uh, to be consistent with your fiduciary duty. That was a big deal. That was a shot heard around the world. And in 2003, when the SEC came out with the rule that's been talked about, it was a really simple rule. And I think Commissioner Atkins got it right in his remarks at the time. It, it on its face, was a free market solution. Have policies and procedures to deal with the conflict surrounding voting. But a lot of folks in this community, especially the uh, proxy advisory firms who wanted, wanted it to be so, thought this was the SEC's version of the Avon letter. Now the SEC is mandating that you vote uh, every vote, every share, and that was actually incorrect. That was one of the main uh, issues we took on in SLB 20, which is the guidance that came out of June uh, last year from the staff that Professor Verrett mentioned. And so you know, this notion coming from Avon put into the 2003 rule that you need to vote every vote, every share was, was huge. But also within that rule text itself, putting aside the no action letters that were mentioned to ISS and Egan Jones, the rule text itself said if there is a conflict, the advisor can prove to the SEC that the vote was unconflicted by the use of an independent third party. Right? That magic language is actually in the rule. So when we had our own proxy advisory roundtable in December of 2013, there was a healthy amount of debate about whether the no action letters were the original sin or the rule. Truth is, it doesn't really matter. You had a rule that basically implied the use of an independent third party would cleanse you of a conflict that otherwise could get you in really deep trouble, uh, both under ERISA, I would say, and the federal securities laws. And then you followed it with two new action letters, one to ISS itself saying, you know, don't worry, uh, if you use a proxy advisory firm, that is the independent third party we were talking about. If you have a conflict as an advisor, this is going to cleanse your hands, I think is, uh, is the phrase they used. And then a second letter to Sean Egan's firm, Egan Jones, saying, oh yeah, and if you're the proxy advisory firm and you're providing advice, and you're also, if you have ancillary business lines, right? So if you actually do corporate consulting work for the issuer that you're rating and that advisors are relying on your recommendation for, that's not a conflict. Horrifying. <clears throat> Horrifying, right? So that's 2003 <clears throat> and 2004. 2006, you have the SEC compensation rules come out, which, of course, uh, you know, brings up a whole lot more data and votes uh, for the advisors. You have Dodd-Frank with say on pay, say on frequency. You have, uh, as Professor Verrett said, the 14AA process, which, by the way, I just issued a paper at WLF saying the SEC should get out of the business of running 14AA, and I mean it uh, sincerely. The, all of these numbers, the number of votes is going up dramatically, 1,000 plus percent in the last 10, 15 years, using rough uh, numbers. And um, it, you know, at the same time, the proxy advisory firms have become more and more entrenched. The numbers are up, the number of retail investors are down, these advisors need to rely on somebody to do some of the work, unless, of course, they can do it themselves. And that's why we needed, in 2014, uh, Staff Legal Bulletin 20. And that's why, for years, four years, I focused intently on this proxy advisory firm issue. It goes to the very core of corporate governance in the United States, which is unfortunate in many ways, because, as you guys all know, uh, those of you who went to law school, if not... You know, corporate governance is a creature of state law in the United States. It's not a federal system, nor should it be. But the use of these rules uh, that I just mentioned and Professor Rett mentioned, plus the role of the proxy advisory firms, means that the federal government has gotten further and further entrenched into corporate governance. And, of course, the proxy advisory firm being a key component of this new structure is completely unregulated, right? 
Now, I'm not one for needless regulation, but when I look at the analogy, the main analogy between the proxy advisory firm and the credit rating agencies, right? The credit rating agencies had exactly the same privileged perch within the federal securities laws as the proxy advisory firms. They, they basically were inserted by legislation, by rule, into so many places, the NRSRO, the Nationally Recognized Statistical Rating Organization, that their opinions became the law. And that didn't work out so well in 2008, right? Congress, though, in 2006, some people forget, actually uh, had a very bipartisan statute, the Credit Rating Agency Reform Act of 2006, to get at this very issue. They said, we can't have, in, in the case of credit rating agencies, three firms controlling 98% of the market. They're not registered. They're not examined. They have conflicts. There are all these problems. And they have this privileged perch. So let's get at it by requiring them to register, prohibiting conflicts, mandating disclosure of conflicts. It was actually, in many ways, a very light touch piece of legislation, but very intrusive into the rating agency industry. So there, Congress took note I'll point out to you, of a very similar issue and acted. Now, in Dodd-Frank, of course, in Title IX, the uh, Congress acted a whole lot more with respect to rating agencies, and we could debate that separately. I think a lot of that stuff was silly. Uh, but here you have the same thing. You have two firms controlling 90-plus percent of the industry. They can control it because they've been baked in through SEC rules, through the Avon letter, uh, through these no-action letters. The staff guidance that came out in 2014, first I'll point out, I totally agree that it should have been commission level or even statutory would be great. Um, I will also caution you, though, in this day and age, sometimes staff guidance is better than commission guidance. Uh, yeah, beware what you, what you ask for. Um, having, having lost 16 3-2 votes in, in four years at the commission, you might not want that 3-2 vote um, for, for uh, uh, proxy I mean, advisor I'm guidance. Chairman <laughs> That's fair enough. <laughs> We're, that would be fine with me. Um, but, the, but the staff guidance was as good as we could get. It took, and I, I'll be totally candid with you guys, it took my entire focus in 2014. It took me telling the chairman of the SEC that this was one of two issues, this and Reg A, uh, under the JOBS Act, that were important to me in the year of 2014. And I think she got it, right? That she, there was no running and no hiding on this issue. We were going to have to do something. And I appreciate that she did prioritize it, and I appreciate the substance that came out. As I said in my WLF paper on this uh, very topic, though, I'm not convinced that SLB 20 is the answer. I think there's some really important things that were done in the staff guidance, you know, clarifying that you don't have to vote every vote, every, every share that you can prearrange with your clients, uh, clarifying that these conflicts that proxy advisory firms have have to be disclosed, hugely important. And I think it'll take a little bit of time for the changes under this staff guidance uh, to take control. But I don't think that means that you here can just forget about this issue. I think it's an issue of national priority to this day. If I were you, I'd want to know uh, from the SEC, well, how did the guidance work? What are they finding? You know, the, uh, the uh, Office of Compliance Inspections and Examinations at the SEC put out a notice this year saying they were going to examine investment advisors for how they're using this guidance, SLB 20, right? Because the advisors were put on notice, you're a fiduciary, you can't rotely rely. You have to do more than rely on ISS or Glass-Lewis. So the examiners are gonna be in there looking to see what is being done. And if you're a smaller, medium-sized advisor, I have to tell you, at some point, you gotta weigh the costs and benefits. You're running a little index fund, who really cares about the votes? My clients don't care about the vote. Why don't I just put in my prospectus a notice to them that says, I'm just going to vote with management, right? If you come and invest in my fund, we're voting with management. If you have some sort of inclination in another direction, why don't you just say, we're voting with CalPERS, right? Pick whatever you want. You could even say you're not going to vote, and I don't think a lot of people would do that because there's been so, made, so much made about the fiduciary duty for voting. But I think as a small, medium-sized advisor, that's eventually going to have to be the way it works because they're facing otherwise a breach of their fiduciary duty that's been made clear <clears throat> by the staff guidance. And so it might take some time, but I think policymakers here more than the SEC should be inclined right now to continue to be vigilant on this and determine, you know, is it time to think again potentially about a, a statute like the Credit Agency uh, Reform Act of 2006. With that, I'll turn it back, I guess, for some questions. Thanks. Thank you.